Thank you for tuning in to Stampscaping 101, another test um, scene for a couple images that are coming out. These uh, birds in flight in two different sizes here against a uh, night sky. That's kind of what the thing that I uh, was thinking about in terms of uh, different applications of these more silhouette styles of images doing kind of dramatic backdrops for the, uh, you know, the subjects of the scene. This is a half page scene, four and a quarter by 11 inches, and uh, I don't know, I just wanted to leave a lot of space for these birds. They, they can be done, you know, this would be a card size right here, and I think that would be a really nice scene as well, okay? But just kind of elongating it, that maybe adds a little bit more drama and space to kind of play around, and it gave me a space, uh, space to stamp a quote image, but had a lot of fun with this one, as I do with all of my scenes, but uh, I really enjoyed kind of all the textures um, introduced into the scene, and I played around with something a little bit different in this one, too. This is the, uh, I did this interplay between the versifying pad and my, oh, my black dye based pad and the Marvy pads are really really dark in terms of the black but the versifying is even blacker as I can see here these images right back here were stamped in the Marvy black and this is the versifying so the versifying is really really dark and stark but it provides a nice contrast because if these trees represent something a little bit farther back in the distance, then you can have these birds right here stand out even more so by stamping them in an even darker black. So these ones, by contrast, become kind of more of a 95% gray, which is interesting to me because uh, I was just, I don't know, I was, I thought it was interesting just how much darker these ones were than that. But that being said, I will spray this later and that will make all of this scene uh, much darker because when dye-based inks dry, they typically dry um, lighter in appearance, but then you spray them with an acrylic spray or spray sealant, and it kind of brings back the uh, intensity, value, and vibrancy of a freshly stamped wet image, or colored background in this case. Okay, so a lot of little highlights added into the scene using variations of uh, colored gel pens, all right? And I also did that kind of splatter painting with my Dr. Martin's Bleed Proof White. You can see that little variation down there. All that type of thing can be done with a gel pen, but you know that splatter painting gives this kind of a little bit more of a random uh, application of kind of light on dark. And it provides a nice texture, so this scene here might be representative of like a early snow or something like that, and here these birds are kind of migrating or whatnot. So anyways, if you watched the video, I hope you enjoy it. I really enjoyed kind of uh, putting the final touches on this one here and watching it come to life with kind of a little bit more of a glowing moon and a textured, layered um, appearance to the overall. Okay, here's a couple other stamps from the new series of stamps, and this is also in set form. I have a bunch of uh, birds on one plate together, and this one uh, group of uh, birds is, I don't know, it's kind of like a little grouping, a little migration of some sort. And it's in two different sizes, so we can play around with scale and uh, depth within a scene and get that uh, nice visual continuity of having um, similar shapes uh, within a given space. And uh, when it comes to uh, landscapes, uh, sometimes having uh, things in different sizes is nice due to the... Uh, uh, kind of Western perspective, you know, having uh, items uh, larger and smaller uh, within that given field to uh, represent distance. So, anyways, technically speaking, as far as practically speaking, it's just fun to have things in two different sizes uh, when it comes to stamping.
All right, so with something like this, try to get as close as you can, but uh, you don't have to get, you know, cut a, a stamp out perfectly. You don't want to undercut anything and something like this in this space right here. I don't think I want to cut that out. I want to leave that together. Otherwise, you know, the stamp would be really floppy, you know, if I cut this right into here and up here. This, I don't know, that I think that area is supported enough on each side, you know, to not give me an impression right there in the middle. So I hope when I stamp it out in this video, I don't get that space uh, leaving it an impression. Okay, so um, there's all kinds of different ways you can do this. I, I made these particular birds kind of in silhouette. You can see they're kind of mostly solid. And uh, that's for the purpose of, you know, being able to do whatever you want to do in the background. And if you stamp these objects dark enough, they'll really stand out against the background without, um, you know, having to work around them. They can practically be an afterthought on your sky figures. Okay, let's do something fairly quick. I wasn't going to do a video tonight, but I've been doing, working on the computer like for two days straight, working on uh, doing some troubleshooting uh, with an email server, and then uh, I was working on HTML for the new designs all day, so doing that all, you know, actually for two days, it's kind of driving me nuts, so I need to uh, have some fun time with the stamps and uh, test out some new stamps. All right, I just inked this up with a dark blue. It's a uh, Prussian blue. It's a really dark blue, almost black, in fact. But I want some variation in here, so this is just a uh, dye-based ink pen. Okay, this one's manganese blue. And I think I've actually added water to it because uh, these pens are super, super old. They were kind of new, but I didn't use them for a long time. And uh, they really dried out, but I was able to just reconstitute them, you know, just by opening up the back and adding some water to it. Okay, so I'm just kind of streaking in some color. And, you know, dye-based inks are watercolors, so uh, this is really quite juicy, so it's wet enough to wear you know, hopefully an impression, it gives me a, kind of an interesting impression and, you know, maybe even kind of something akin to, uh, you know, the spirit of a kind of a watercolor-y looking thing, you know, like a watercolor painting, in not the overall impression, but in some areas within the impression. Maybe it's in some of the more solid areas, you can see how wet that is. So that being said, I, I really never know what I'm going to get uh, when I do that type of... Uh, color application just because of the variation that can happen within there. It really depends on how wet my ink pad is, how wet my uh, pen is, how much you apply here and there. can do it more of a streakier look. And you can see it, it's almost kind of separating on there. It's kind of built up. I was thinking about blotting off some of this. I want this moon to kind of glow. So I think I'm going to take off some of the ink around the moon and on the uh, um, the texturing on the surface there. So I'm just kind of blotting off some of this. Now that um, Prussian blue is really, really dark, so I'm not really quite sure how much you know this is going to influence the end result. Sometimes I kind of dab some off and I stamp it out and it's as dark as if I didn't you know blot any off at all. So uh, we'll see, but um, I don't really worry about it one way or another, you know. Whatever happens kind of happens. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, have, I don't have some kind of firm idea in mind of how I want something to look. I have a general idea, and I just kind of let the scenes kind of, I don't know, go their own way, whatever way they seem to be going. Okay, now I, I don't, like I said, I, there's not too much variation in here at all. A little bit down there about where I blotted it, but I don't think I see too much of that, uh... Um, manganese blue in there. It probably, and now if I just did this straight and stamped it, it would probably be darker than that, so maybe that's where it uh, comes into play. Okay, but let's move on to the next stamp. This is the Cloud Cumulus Large. Let's go with uh, a blue, maybe not the manganese. This one's just kind of a navy blue. 
Now, if you only have a navy blue, just just use that, you know, like a memento Danube blue would be good. Something like that, just one of your darker ones. Yeah, if you have a medium blue, then just use that. All right. I'm going to take this up here. I'm going to overlap this cloud and into this impression, the cloud with the rising moon, a decent amount. And around on the perimeter, I'm going to blot off the edges pretty good, you know, about a quarter inch to a half inch in here and blot fairly uh, substantially, okay? And what that does is it kind of uh, softens the edge of your uh, impression that you're about to make. And where it softens the edge, it transitions into the previous um, image uh, a little bit more gracefully than to, to not blot it off, okay? So you see that kind of transitioning in here. See, I don't have this rectangle shape right in here, so it's hard to see where one image ends and the other one begins. And that's the fun thing about um, scenic stamping. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the blending aspect of stamps, you want stamps that are going to blend together nice and easy without too much fuss. Okay, now you notice I don't have to use any kind of... Uh, masking or anything like that because we do want images to overlap into one another, right? You don't want to have to do, uh, you know, post-it notes or something like that. When it comes to this style of stamping, you know, there's stamps that are outlines in which, you know, careful masking and cutouts, that type of thing, you know, are uh, applicable. But when it comes to tonal designs, if they're drawn well, in terms of the transition areas on them, you won't have to worry about, um, you know, careful placement and uh, masking, etc. Okay? So again, each time I do this, I re-ink it, I blot off the edge. The reason why I don't go for a second impression, I don't stamp it here, then just go here again, because the second impression would be so much lighter, so I want the value of these impressions to be roughly the same. If it was a lot lighter, then I'd be able to see those edges a little bit more prominently, okay? Now, that being said, one of the nice things about scenic stamping, too, is if you apply colors over the top of it, tones, you know, you sponge on some extra colors, even if things don't blend perfectly well um, in this impression um, stage, then, when you blend in some colors over the top of it, if you're working on matte paper, you can blend it in with some chalks or pastels, colored pencil, etc. Or you can sponge in uh, dye-based inks over the top of this. That will also um, blend all of your imagery together um, really nicely as well. So even if you don't get it in the impression part, then you can get it in the toning part. So. Don't toss out your scenes. You can always uh, just keep adding to them. I've never seen a scene that, um, you know, where something has happened and, you know, something has just gone, you know, gone awry and there's no way to recover it. There's always something you can do in scenic stamping, uh, you know. In the worst case scenario, if there's an area that's just absolutely doesn't seem, you know, it seems beyond hope in terms of uh, repairing it, you just stamp a dark tree over the top of it, and uh, and it's gone. Or something like that, just some darker object. It could be those birds or something like that, you know? These birds can be flying right across there. Okay. Okay, let's see, I'm kind of getting up here. Now, I don't want to stamp this so low that I'm going to be stamping it right into my moon, okay? So I don't want to stamp it here, but, you know, somewhere like that would be good. You can see that I'm just stamping it right into this one. It goes about right here. In no way does this have to be really careful, you know? Okay, see how that blends right in there? All right, then we just need another one right around here, and we're ready to go. Now, one of the things I did here, notice that these clouds are toplit. But see, if I stamp it up here, the moon is underneath. So what I did was I 
turned it around, now the clouds over the top of the moon are bottom lit. Okay? If you did it like this, you know, it would be okay. But I, th I just think this looks a little bit easier in terms of the transition of uh, lighting to do it that way. And that's why that's been designed that way. So you can kind of... Oh, you can reflect the, uh, the lighting direction with the direction that you stamp your cloud in. Okay, so let's say I was stamping, I don't know, something in here. There was a sun or something like that or a moon or something like that. I could do this this way, and the moon would be reflecting on that, or the moon would be reflecting this way, you know, so, you know, I can also do it like that, I can do it like that. There's all kinds of different ways you can do it, but the biggest thing is just don't be too careful with your placement and overlap adequately, so really super careful placement and positioning and, you know, exact um, alignment is not good, you know, when it comes to this. But it's a thing that makes it, in application, a lot easier to do than many forms of stamping, but it's also the thing that, if someone's new to scenic stamping, it's the thing that, it's the concept that's a little bit harder because they're used to doing things much more carefully and controlled than just overlapping a bunch of designs, you know, without the use of, you know, papers because they're used to something, you know, that kind of a process with um, a lot of outline designs and being able to see where one image ends and the other one begins, okay? And this way right here, everything kind of blends together. And then, of course, you can blend in some additional tones over the top of this. And uh, if you gave that to someone, you know, even if they're a rubber stamper, but, you know, they haven't done things like scenic stamping before, they never know how you did it because it's not easily um, kind of visually um, apparent as to where someone began, you know, what was the, uh, the process, you know, in uh, the creation of the piece. All right, now... We're going to uh, direct our lighting with the use of shadow, okay? Here's my moon in here. I want that to be fairly light. And here's these clouds around here. If I want that to be really light in appearance, then you have to kind of make the areas around it darker. But I don't want to make everything darker. Now, do you see in these clouds right here, there's certain areas where they're darker than others, okay? Those are the areas that I'm going to kind of darken a little bit more with some tone. Um, so I'll reiterate the shadow effects that are already inherent in the design. So when you're thinking about um, adding in some shading to your scenes, um, it doesn't have to be a big mystery as to where to start. You can just kind of go with, uh, or you can start off with kind of what's already down there, what's already been laid out. Okay, now I'm just going to start off with some this is a, by the way, a four and a quarter size page by 11. It's a half page. I just wanted to do something kind of longer again. I really like that kind of elongated format. And this mm, is a stylus tool right here. It looks like it has some green from my previous scene. Um, I'm not going to take the time to clean that off. All right, I'm just going to blot it off like that. And if it has some green in here, then so be it. Okay? So I just put some reinker fluid onto this pad cap here. You can use any kind of light blue, okay? I would go with something like a sky blue. Go with something as light as you can. That one happens to be a discontinued um, color called aqua from the Adirondack line from Ranger. Okay, now see in here? I'm just kind of painting along, and I like to do the uh, perimeter. A little bit, or a lot. And see, anything that I kind of retain, you know, have light, it means, just simply means that it's reflecting more of the light that the moon is, you know, casting, all right? So if this is the light source, maybe I don't have too much of this around that moon, but I do want that moon to be kind of bright, or light. So I do have to bring some of this color in here, so 
I'll, I'll be a little more selective as far as um, where I'm putting my color when it comes to the medium and darker tones. But I'm also, you know, kind of establishing shadow and light in this initial color too. Now sometimes that's a little bit too stark white for me, so I, I like to put a little bit of tone across that moon. Leave some white though, and I'll show you why later on. Okay, see this right on the perimeter. See this is kind of nice when you kind of ink up with your reinker fluid. This thing's really loaded up with ink. What you're doing is you're kind of creating kind of a a uh, ink pad on a stick when you you know saturate some ink in the foam padding right here now if you're just working with the pad you know you would just take it like this and you dip in and go but sometimes you know it's just easier if you have some rinker fluid put it in there and you're set for the entire um, duration of uh, usage of this color I like it too in my at least my first color too because it establishes a really good coating of this particular color on the page and I like to do that with oftentimes with my lightest tones because when I start adding in some darker tones like navy blue and whatnot you know the I don't want to get a big oval shape like that in a really dark ink over here. So uh, if I get kind of everything a little bit saturated and some in the class once said, you know, it's like you're kind of, you're almost lubricating the, uh, the surface with that first color of ink. And that's a pretty good description because what happens is, um, you're kind of saturating the uh, the pulp of the paper a little bit when you do this. So I'm not just going for coloring, okay? I'm going for a little bit of saturation, so I'm kind of applying this, and it's not even really getting any darker. But what I'm doing is I'm kind of establishing this layer of ink on here so that when I add those other colors of ink, they'll really spread and blend very easy for me because the surface is already going to be a little bit wet. So wet into wet those colors spread very easy. If you're going with something like a darker blue and you go like that, you know, it's going to leave a big oval shape, okay? So with these lighter colors, if you do that, it's not really any big deal because they're so light. The contrast between that super light color in the background is not that much, all right? So in other words, get a good saturation with that first color and spend most of the time that you're going to be toning with that first color. Don't try to jump into the darker tones too fast. You want to kind of get that established. The more you spend time with that first color, the easier every other color will be to apply over the top of that um, in a nice, graceful, easy manner. Okay, this one's kind of a, another lighter blue. It's Caribbean blue. It's kind of moving into the medium blues. Memento is a really good one too, the Bahama Blue. I can use some of that here too. You can see, you can just mix and match. Don't bother cleaning off the previous color, just move into your next color, okay? See that, how much darker that is right there? Memento, this one's a pretty bright one. I, I really like it um, in terms of a, another color. Memento inks too, are, they're thicker, so they're really slippery which is kind of nice because they really blend beautifully, okay? Don't scrub back and forth thinking, okay, I, it's got to get darker real fast. Just gradually bring up your tones and your values in your scene nice and slowly, okay? Work an area. Don't just do this. Don't try to get your whole car done like instantly, okay? Work small areas like this, and that way you'll get a nice transition from darker to lighter like that, okay? Now see this is kind of dry on here, so it's not applying as much ink. And the lighter taps in here, because there's drier ink on here, I can use that in the lighter areas closer to my light source. So darker on the outside, more saturation on the outside, drier and lighter 
on the inside, okay? All right. Now, I spent a good amount of time with that first color, so these um, incrementally darker colors that I use are really fast to apply because the um, page is fairly saturated with ink. So, when you're applying your other colors over the top of that, it's not absorbing into the paper that fast, so you're able to use that ink on the surface of the paper and really spread it around. Okay. The only thing you have to remember here is just take your time and add a lot of ink. Okay. If anyone ever has a, kind of a harder time with this process, it's because it's every time um, they just try to move into the uh, darker tones too fast, like they're working with, say, the first color, but they see the end result being, you know, something like this, and they're thinking, why doesn't it look like that? You know, they're, but they're only on their first color, so they kind of rush into those ones, and the end result, and it becomes a little bit more of a precarious process. Now, this one right here, I mean, I can do anything on here. I can just, I can do that, but see, this really spreads out easily because I added enough of that first color, so it's all kind of in that, that first color, you know. Whatever it might be, it's just uh, kind of laid down there. Now this is just with the dye base tanks. You can do this on matte paper. Um, I would recommend a coated matte paper just so it's not so absorbent. But I have, you know, done tests and in video format on this channel. And you can see that. I think it's in the materials or techniques playlist, okay, somewhere. And I was, I was really kind of surprised at how easily the uh, ink spread on matte paper. It's a little bit of a different feel because glossy cardstock, you know, is just a slicker surface, okay? But you can do this on matte. Now, if I was doing this on matte paper too, maybe instead of this type of process with, um, you know, a sponge tip like that, you can use stipple brushes or something like that, and that adds this nice, really soft application of inks onto your paper. Or you can use things like uh, what was kind of seemed to be the favorite medium in, with uh, stampers in Germany, for, you know, early on. I don't know what they're doing now, but it seems like a lot of them used colored pencils way back in the like the 80s and 90s, you know. Everyone did. There was everyone. So many people did landscape stamping there, and they all used colored pencils, and it looked fantastic. Colored pencils is really one of my favorite looks in rubber stamping. Do I do it? Not really. I, I don't do too much of it, but I sure like the look, and I love things like watercolor paints, and there's some people that are really awesome at that. Um, but I don't know, I just came to start using a lot of this, but I am using a lot of different uh, media, especially with the Mood and Media series of videos here, so I'll get back to that at some point in time, but I really wanted to test out some of my uh, new stamps with my kind of my favorite technique or my good kind of go-to technique glossy cardstock uh, D. Grunig was one of the ones to start using a lot of the uh, um, Marvy pens back in the day and she used glossy cardstock and uh, my boss from uh, Stamp of the Hand, Kathy Okamoto um, introduced a, you know store to that because she uh, was a customer of D's or a supplier for D2, and uh, I just started using it. And then the, I don't know. That's how we always did all our coloring over at a stamp of the hand company. Okay, so I'm moving into my darker blue here. The perimeter is getting fairly dark now. The darker you take some areas of your scene. Again, the lighter the light areas are going to seem by contrast, okay? So you can see that what that uh, color is doing. I added over here, but not over here yet, so we'll just keep doing that. I kind of want to get this, uh, I kind of want to get this pretty dark. I want some, uh, I re really want to put that uh, silhouette kind of a spirit of those birds to the test, you know, having them nice and solid. 
I'll have them kind of flying against a darker background. You can always have them flying against a much lighter background, but they'll really be put to the test when you have kind of a darker imagery in the back here, because they'll, st they'll need to stand out against that background, and we'll see if they can. If you'll notice, I'm kind of just spinning my card. I'm stamp, you know, coloring it upside down here. You don't always have to have things like this because this will wear out my hand, you know. And I like to keep everything kind of within my kind of range of effect of this, you know, like this. I'm hardly ever moving this hand. I'm just kind of moving the card, you know. schemes. The Caribbean blue has given it a little bit of a warmth as opposed to just kind of a cool um, temperature scheme. Let's go a little bit darker right up in this area. All right, let's check out that. Uh, I, did, I need to uh, re-ink this Prussian blue. I was looking for a re-inker for it, but I couldn't find anything. Initially, it's I have it somewhere, or I have one of them. <sighs> Boy, that was really dark there. Prussian blue just, if you ever get this re-inker bottle from Marvy, it's a beautiful, beautiful blue, but be careful because even though it's wet down here, I mean it's not wet to the touch or anything like that, but uh, it's damp, but it doesn't matter how damp that is, it's this Prussian blue will make its mark very quickly. It just it penetrates the surface and there's something, it's almost like has a thinner um, kind of makeup or something like that, uh, you know, uh, it penetrates the surface of thicker inks instantly, you know, so... I mean, I still, you know, can do something like that, and it really spreads out for me, but, you know, I wouldn't do that, but uh, just to make a point. But it is beautiful. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful blue. I really liked um, some of the darker uh, blue inks out there in the past, like... Uh, there was an Adirondack denim, and uh, I think there was a, I don't know, the, well, some of the first uh, raised dye base pads were called, uh, by clear snap were called, it was a line called Vivid, and within that range of uh, colors, it was really fantastic for me because there were about maybe seven different versions of blue. They were blue-green, light, medium, dark, uh, turquoise, light, medium, dark, you know what I mean? There was just, there were warm blues, cool blues, there were, I don't know, violets, you know, kind of a transition of blue into violet. I don't know, they had everything. It was awesome. And those haven't been out in, I don't know. I don't know when the last time the Vivids were available. Kind of had a strange pad, too. It was a real thick foam. Anyways, what what is your... Anyone have any recommendations on uh, Dark Blue that you know of? Let me know. Alright. 
So far, so good. We need to go to black, though, don't we? That's as dark as it's going to get using blue, at least the blues that I have. So let's move on to black. I don't even know where my black pad is now. All right, there's one of them. Okay, still just use the same pad that you're working with. I was showing people in my last video, uh, you know, if you don't have a stylus closure or something like that, you can always go with a, uh, like a cosmetic sponge. It's just one of those little wedges here. Okay. It has a bit of that, you know, that edge there, but you know, you can make do with things and uh, use them for whatever purposes you're kind of aiming for, okay? Some tools are just simply going to work, you know, easier than others. Like this one's more ergonomic, of course, because it's like a pen, but these are very inexpensive, you know, and I don't know. It, it's, it's a really good sponge quality for... Um, this type of application because it's a very dense foam, but uh, you know it will work if you if you need something like that. Okay, look how dark that is. See that with the black? See that? It kind of contains the image, doesn't it? Or the composition more? I don't have it over here, but it really kind of frames things off to have those four corners a little bit darker. It doesn't have to be super dark, but just darker than the surroundings. That's called, that's like what they do in photography and like a studio um, photography. That's usually a, a vignette around uh, the individual, which is very pleasing. It kind of contains the objects or, or the people within the uh, composition, and it focuses the uh, the attention and keeps the attention within the uh, the, the composition, the framework. Okay, so see that right there? Dark that gut. But look how deep and rich a blue that is because even though the black is going over the blue, the blue underneath is influencing kind of what you can see because even though this is a black, it is all inks, dye based inks are transparent. So the colors underneath are going to show through. This is black, just, you know, on a piece of bl blotter paper right there, but look how much, you know, richer this is right here to that. So that if you do cover up certain areas with other colors, it's not, you know, that you waste time with those previous um, applications. They'll always kind of... Re uh, influence the end result um, in a very good way. I think one of the uh, ways some of the old oil painters, the old masters, used to do things, sometimes they do kind of monochromatic uh, compositions and then they just do, you know, layer upon like dozens of layers of transparent washes, you know, clear transparent washes over the top of that. And uh, it would give it a really deep saturation and a very uh, kind of dimensional, realistic look. Not that we're going for realism or that we're doing that type of thing, but it's kind of like a very simplistic idea of that concept or simplistic application of that concept. All right. Okay, let me do a size check here. This, these are these birds here. Flying across. All right, let's do something. I'm going to go grab some trees. And we'll kind of create this um, tree line here. Maybe we'll put a little bit of moonlight shining on some of the tree limbs, or tree tops, and then, uh, then we'll stamp out our subject matter within the scene. Okay, let me go. I need some fairly solid trees down here. Okay, 
I have a couple of different trees here, pine trees. This is the spruce large. This one's just called um, pine. And then I have some uh, kind of uh, dead trees that'll provide a nice kind of textural contrast to the other trees. And I don't know, it kind of looks more full to me in some ways when you add in uh, kind of some different shapes and textures within a given space. Um, I don't know, there's something to uh, contrast, such as the living and the dead together, you know. It just seems more full to me. Okay, so... I'm thinking here about... I'm trying to think of whether I wanted to use the, uh, the Marvy Black or the Versifying Black. The Versifying Black is really, really dark. And I could do both, but um, I'm not really sure. Okay, now let me see. Let me position these birds about where they'll be going. I think they'll be going about right here and here. Maybe more than one impression. I can do these ones out here too. Kind of. Maybe I'll do the smaller ones. The smaller birds will be in maybe the Marvy Black, because the Marvy Black, as dark as I thought that was, it's not nearly as dark as the, uh, the Versifying, so... And I'll position these trees kind of right around here. Okay. Now as I do this, keep in mind it's... <laughs> there's... A lot of ways you can do this. Maybe I'll do. Maybe, you know what I'll do? I'll do. The, let, let's do a test here. Let's do some of the uh, foreground objects. You know, the, the birds and these trees. Let's let's use two different uh, versions of black. Let's use this one, and then we'll use the uh, the versifying as well. Maybe we'll get a little bit of a kind of a subtle uh, difference in. Uh, values within that given space by using the two different uh, types of uh, color. Two different types of ink, I should say. Okay, now when you're doing something like when you're repeating your imagery, what I'd recommend is changing the height of it, you know, around a little bit, so... Um, so it doesn't look so repetitive, okay? You want the continuity from repetition, but you don't want it to be so kind of, uh, you know, picket fence-ish, you know, in terms of everything, you know, being exactly the same height. And play around with it a little bit, spacing-wise. I'm always inking up more than I think I need, just so I don't stamp it out and I get this big space, you know, down here where I didn't ink up. Okay, look how beautiful those uh, clouds are looking with that contrast of the uh, solid, darker shape right in front of it. All right, let's play around with the uh, pine a little bit. Let's see what that looks like. In forest, you often see mixes of, you know, types of trees together.
this one I just raised up quite a bit. I hope I inked up enough down there. Yeah, fine. Okay. What I have to do when it comes to stuff like this, I have to kind of really consciously kind of put things in a little bit more of an irregular pattern because the tendency is, is to uh, kind of space everything out really symmetrically and evenly, you know. I don't know, it's just locked in our heads to do things that way. So I have to kind of forcibly, you know, get myself to, uh, you know, vary it. See, I'm kind of overlapping this tree quite a bit. Now maybe I'll do this one really close to that other pine right there there. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily right next to each other on Earth. It could be, this one could be 20 feet away from this one, you know, for all we know. So it's just kind of creating that nice, I don't know, what is it, tree line, I guess. Okay, well, now let's vary it a little bit more. Let's try the, uh, the leafless pine imagery, image stamps. All right, my acrylic blocks here um, have tack and peel applied to it for that temporary uh, mounting method system. Okay, it's ready to go. I forgot. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> Let's use some of the versifying in some of this area. Okay. Alright, the versifying, for those that might not know, is a black, or this one's, there might be other colors of versifying. This one's the black versifying, which is a, uh, a uh, pigment ink. Okay. It's different than dye based inks. Versifying in particular, as opposed to other you know, types of uh, um, pigment ink gives you a really crisp, fine impression, okay? It doesn't quite so, you know, fill up the, uh, the detail areas, okay? Ooh, look at that. Fairly dramatic, huh? It's a really dominant uh, figure within the scene. Okay. Let me go with a smaller version of it as well. Uh, let me use the, uh, let me use my smaller block here. I need to wash off my tack and peel. It's not so tacky anymore. It gets dusty after a while, but all you have to do is rinse it off in water. Kind of let it air dry and it really gets super sticky again. Okay, that was the uh, the Versify. Let me use uh, Marvy for this one. This one's going to going to be smaller, so maybe it represents kind of a tree farther in the distance, back in the distance. So the Marvy isn't quite as dark black as that Versify. It's reasonably dark. That's it's real dark, but uh, but just nothing compares to Versify. I don't know that I know of. So. So let's go with this one here. Okay. I'll put an odd number of the uh, kind of the dead trees. Okay. They say that. Uh, Compositionally, things uh, kind of in odd numbers uh, blend well together. So one, 
two, three, four, five. Not that you have to do any of that, I'm just saying. It's one of those little subtle details, maybe, in terms of the compositional kind of uh, arrangements. Okay, now there's something kind of missing right in this space here, and I think it needs another tree. Let's go with the let's go with the spruce again. Something a little bit more solid. Or oops, I went with the versifying. Well, let's go with the versifying then. Isn't that beautiful over here? That those different tones of blue, those uh, ink colors. Kind of more of a black and white. Um, person, but uh, when, you know, like different types of uh, ink brand colors are layered over the top of one another and kind of gets this deep, rich kind of saturation, I really love that. Uh, kind of a intensity statement uh, in terms of brightness. I love uh, deep, rich layers of uh, color. All right, I'm just kind of framing things off a little bit more and going with the versifying here. All right, so we have that. Okay, let's bring in our kind of the main stars of the scene, which will be those birds, I think. I don't know. Maybe the moon moonlight's the main star of the scene. We'll see. fit on here. It does. Just barely. Oh, that's not hanging off there too much. We can always angle it a little bit too, but this will do. Okay, these birds I think I'll do in the versifying. Okay. First impression. All these birds flying. I, I want them kind of flying right across the moon. Or partially. You know, for that added drama and contrast of an uh, object against light source. Okay. Good. It's interesting. The um, versifying ink is so thick that um, it kind of, I didn't hold it down there, for, you know, long enough before I pulled it up, but some of it kind of came up as if in a vacuum off of the, uh, the surface there. But it looks pretty good because it gave it a little bit of variation. So it Kind of in the impression has a little bit of inherent lighting in it uh, by doing so. Okay, let's do this one. This one's a little bit farther back in the distance, so maybe we'll go with the Marvy on this one. Uh, 
this is the Marvy Black. You can maybe I'll do this. Let me do this. Let me add some of the Prussian blue on there too, so it's even lighter maybe in the distance than black. Okay. We'll see what combination. I don't know if I just blotted off all the black or, or what, but let's put this other birds right back in here. Now that is pretty dark down there. Maybe I'll go underneath it where it's a little bit lighter for this impression. I'll hold this down a little bit longer. Just because the uh, surface of the page is fairly... I don't know, saturated. It's not down to the touch. It's not going to get ink all over my fingers, but there we go. Looks pretty good. It's a little bit lighter, so it kind of pushes it back in the distance a little bit more. Could have been even lighter than that, but we could put more there too, but I'm trying to think if that would be overkill. Maybe, I don't know, it might be kind of a larger migration, but I think that will be my statement right there as far as birds go. All right, now one of the things that's going to be super fun to do on this one, because of that moonlight in there, and the fact that I've left, I've, reta oops, I've retained some areas of uh, parts of the card um, as white, I'm going to bring in some... Uh, pigment ink in here and really soften up this area in here and give it a nice glow but before I do that this area down here is really wet in terms of the uh, the impressions you can kind of see it right here you can see those birds you can see that glistening with that uh, versifying paint there maybe down here too this paint does dry pretty fast but or the, I call it paint you know it's pigment ink, but look at that. That tree right there is really quite wet. It almost looks dimensional. See how it it looks like it's raised against that tree down there when I do that? And that's the difference between that uh, Versafine and the uh, Marvy. It's it's really thick. And, and this spruce right here is done in the uh, Versafine. You can see how wet it is. Does it see? It seems kind of uneven, but it does give you a really strong impression. Okay, but that being said, I'll wait for this to dry. I'm going to give it overnight and come back into it and add these little final touches that should really bring this um, already rich scene, I think, to life even more by adding in some uh, textural details and... Uh, lighting details as well, kind of lighting, uh, light defining details. Okay. All right. So that is the end of the, uh, I don't know, I guess it's step one. We're kind of largely on our way though, but, uh, we'll do those little refinements that are really fun to do. Okay. I have given this scene overnight to dry and, uh, I don't know, with that quick cut there in this uh, video, you might notice that um, sometimes the, uh, the colors of the dye-based inks when they dry like this are, um, they're a little bit duller uh, than what they look like when they were freshly applied. And that's usually the case, but you just give it a quick spray with some spray sealant, and I'll do a video on that too, but we have other videos up already on that but it brings back the saturation and intensity of all of the uh, inks that have been applied if not making it look even better than when they were freshly applied um, I don't know that's what uh, one of the benefits of doing that plus it'll protect the surface from you know water or something like that not that I don't know you're gonna get water on it or something of that sort but um, yeah okay so let's test here for dryness and it looks good you know some of the wetter areas are they're completely dry which I expected but always good to check it out okay so let's take a look at this and uh, let's assess um, what could be done to it to uh, 
strengthen um, various uh, visual aspects of this scene. So we have the, the moonlight right here, and I think putting some highlights on the sides of some of these trees would look uh, very effective. It could be left just as a strong silhouette like that too, and I think that looks good too. But some of these areas up here um, where we have uh, uh, covered up a lot of the cloud formations um, could be enhanced. The highlights could be enhanced uh, in the lighter areas uh, with some softer forms created with the um, color box frost white pigmentate. You can do, use other brands too, just don't use the uh, Brilliance pad, okay? The Brilliance one dries too fast for the application that we're going to uh, be needing. And uh, let's say we can, these birds right here are completely flat looking, all right? You know, they're supposed to be, you know, just strong silhouettes, which they are, but I think where light meets dark, we can um, kind of enhance some of that. And same thing down here, some of these birds, we can kind of um, turn them in space, as we used to say in classes. Um, you take an object and you kind of give the illusion of a three-dimensional form in some manner or another. But anyways, when I start applying some um, pigment ink to this scene, um, since the light source is right here, on the left-hand side of you know most of these trees, I'll put some highlights, and on the right-hand side of these trees, because they are to the left of the moon, I'll put those highlights um, accordingly. Okay, now we have a lot of different um, variations of this color scheme in gel pen form. Okay, I have white here, which would match the white of the uh, paper that I've retained, just by not toning it out. And here is a blue gel pen. These are both Uniball Signos. I also have um, some really great um, blue variations. Uh, in the form of my shuttle art uh, set here. It's a set of um, 180 different colors, including uh, pastels. Um, glitter, metallic, and multi-tonal um, pens. Let me see, I'm just grabbing a couple pens right now. This one is, you can see that that blue is lighter than this one. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting together kind of a value scheme or range, value range of the same colors that I have used on this scene. And one of the nice things about, you know, one of those cheap multi-packs of uh, pens is that you can really try to match a lot of the uh, colors that you've used. Um, in coloring your scenes because there's just so many different um, variations. A lot of these pens, this is the first time I've used a lot of them, so... Um, yeah, this one seems like more like a salvia blue, cornflower type of blue. So anyways, we have different versions of... Uh, I guess this will be highlights to use on this scene. Let me try to zoom in here as much as possible. I'll try to remember to keep the, uh, my working uh, area in view and not work down here or something like that. I'll try to keep everything, you know, in this camera. Apologies if, uh, if I forget once in a while. I get, I get lost in these scenes when I start doing them and um, sometimes I forget to keep the, my work space in view here, so, okay. Okay, let's start over here. This is a really dark area of the scene, okay? So adding like a white highlight over here sometimes looks a little bit... Um, it's too much in terms of the contrast created, okay? So if this area is in darkness, all right, it would probably mean that there isn't light from, you know, your light source, whatever it is, hitting those areas. So that being said, if you wanted to get a little bit of a um, variation in that, we can use something like a darker blue, and it's within the spirit of the color scheme 
and thus the lighting scheme. We're saying that there's kind of light hitting um, this object and I'll do it within that color scheme. Okay, so now these are all kind of fine-tuned, uh, I don't know, refined kind of uh, um, applications of a given media. That being said, I didn't used to use pastel colors. I would just use um, more highlights, white highlights, closer to my light source, and then I would use less um, farther away from the light source I would get into the darkness. So I would just put like two or three white dots on this tree. So you can do it that way too. But if you have some pens like this, they're really fun to use, you know, and to get into some color and to utilize your media um, uh, fully for what it can provide. I'll probably I'll probably do multi tones. I don't have to. It doesn't have to just be darker blue over here, medium blue over here, lighter blue and white, or something like that. You can mix it up a little bit, you know, and you can just create variation. Okay, now see where this <clears throat> this tree. I mean, we can barely see it here, but you can see that contrast. That was what's kind of nice. There's the Marvy black right there in the uh, spruce tree, um, which is this one, okay? That's the Marvy Black, but look at the variation created by the um, Versafine pad against that, okay? But the contrast is not that extreme. I mean, I could see it if I really hold it up, and when I spray the scene, that black back there is going to get darker, so it'll cut down the contrast between these tree, you know, these tree limbs in front of that one. So, what you can do is I'll take this little gel pen and I'll just put a few little highlights on the top of it. You know, some of these branches. They're in front of the spruce tree. Just to kind of pull those branches out from the you know, from the, uh, the background a little bit more into the foreground. It's not too much because, again, this is a really you know, kind of a medium dark blue here. <clears throat> you can see it a little bit. Let's see if I can get that. See that right there? I've just put a few little dots or a little line on a couple of these branches right here. Maybe another, just a little bit more right here. Now some of these areas where I put that in, this pen, is the same exact value as the background, so it doesn't show up at all. That's when I know I need to move into a lighter blue up here, or white. <clears throat> Excuse me for clearing my throat here. I just ate breakfast. <laughs> Couldn't wait to get to this scene, though. I, I love adding these little touches to a scene. I think it kind of brings it to life a little bit, and uh, it's really fun to do. I like kind of altering the look of objects in a very subtle way. Um, subtle, but very effective, and it, it's the, it's those little details, you know, it's one of those things uh, we used to talk about in school, you know, it's what is it, you know, what are those little things that we can do to our pieces to you want to capture the viewer's attention, but you want to have something, if possible, to hold the, the attention for a little bit longer. And I was trained as an illustrator, and, uh, you know, uh, let's say if someone's turning pages in a magazine or something like that, and uh, you have an illustration in some advertisement or something like that, if you can get that viewer to kind of stop you know, for a second and to look at it, you know, for a couple extra seconds, that's, you know, ideal, that's what you're kind of going after. They might not gaze at it for, you know, minutes or whatever, but the idea is to, you know, your visuals are up against uh, <clears throat> other content in these magazines and whatnot, or books or whatever, and 
you know, you want to kind of hold the attention for someone, you know, you want someone to kind of stop and really enjoy what uh, you know, that uh, visual has to offer. And sometimes it's those uh, little subtle details that will hold the attention, you know. Okay, so kind of bringing this uh, spruce tree out from the background a little bit. And here's this and another uh, kind of a uh, dead tree here, putting a few little highlights on it. Right in here, things get a little bit um, clustered and overlapped, so something like this can bring out you know, some uh, forms out of the background and make it look a little bit more dimensional again. Now, I said on this side of the uh, moon I would put most of my highlights on the right-hand side. It doesn't mean that you can't put some highlights on the, the left. I'll just probably be a little bit more um, right-hand side dominant when it comes to the uh, objects to the left of the moon. Okay, but see, I, I don't know. I put a little on there. Here's this tree again. Branches going in front of the spruce tree. If I put the highlights on the spruce here, then the spruce would look like it's in the foreground, but if I put the highlights on this branch, as a matter of fact, maybe I'll do that. On this side, I, I said that this, you know, tree was in front of that spruce. Over here, um, the spruce and the dead tree were stamped in the Versafine, so they're equally as dark. So, you know, which one's in front of the other just depends on how we approach the highlights. So see, on this one I put those highlights right over the branches of the uh, this dead tree. Sorry. <laughs> so it looks like the spruce is now in front of it, right? But I could have done it the uh, you know the other way, and the uh, this one would be foreground. Okay, and then little highlights on the sides of the tree facing the moon. We could even do uh, snow or something like that falling in the scene. That might be interesting. I don't know if that's that could be in the uh, in the cards, so to speak, for this scene. We'll see. It would mean that the uh, birds might be a little bit late in as far as their migration, but uh, we'll do whatever serves the uh, <clears throat> the visuals in this scene. Okay, that was my Signo. Um, pastel blue. Let's let's see how dark that is right here. Okay. Let's go to I don't know. It's probably it'll be one of these signos. That one's the cornflower one. This one's uh, more of a I don't know, kind of like that manganese blue or something. Okay. <clears throat> let's bring some of this into the mix. It's a little bit different. Um, I could tell the difference. It's a little bit lighter in value. Let's apply some of the tree. We'll layer some of the uh, some of the other gel pen marks. Okay, we have these multi-tonal highlights. Okay, so this tree out here, let's put a few, let's say some of these branches are a little bit more lit. So it kind of starts bringing it back, bringing it out from the background, doesn't it? A few little subtle highlights like that. I don't know. It's getting to be a little bit less subtle, but 
Nevertheless, okay, so see what that looks like right there? Little lines here and there, little dots here and there. Yeah, you can you can mix it up here. Okay. I think this tree could use a few highlights. The spruce. Let's go to that um, lighter. <clears throat> I think this 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 is kind of a lighter, brighter blue, and I haven't used it before. So the Shuttle Art Pens brand of uh, gel pens are a little bit thinner than the Uniball ones. Okay, so we can see what that color is looks like over a piece of white paper, but it's not necessarily going to look like that if you're putting it over color or if you're writing on a black paper or something like that, which is really fun to do with uh, light colored pa uh, pastel gel pens, but the color is going to show through a little bit, which could be good in some ways. You know, you get a little bit more harmony with uh, with your mark and the service that you're using. But, you know, if you want true opacity um, from your gel pen, it might not provide that. But they do that for a reason. It's so that these pens are less prone to clogging if the ink is a little bit thinner. Now, I never have problems with that Signo one, and that one's a little bit more intense, but, you know, this pack of 180 gel pens plus 180 re uh, refills, you know, cartridge, you know, things that came with it cost like $20. No, wait, was it 20 or $25 or something like that? Where, you know, one of the uh, Uniball ones might cost, you know, $2 or something like that. So, uh, no complaints here, you know, as far as translucency with the, uh, the shuttle art ones that uh, they really serve their purpose. Okay, let me see. Okay, Let's bring this up here. You can kind of see some uh, highlights where they've been applied. Down here, you can see where this branch really comes out from the uh, the background, where it kind of merged in with the uh, the darkness of the spruce tree right here. You have these branches standing out a little bit more. And the same goes for this side. You can see it where the highlights are on this side of the uh, tree. On this one. This one over here. A few lines here and there. A few dots here and there. What you do is just kind of just work one thing, you know, a little bit. Don't you know, work forever on one area and then look at it, you know, from arm's distance. Kind of, you have to hold it up at arm's distance periodically and get a feeling for how that, um, how those details are affecting kind of the overall. Because um, it's easy to kind of work really close like this and then you're working like this and this and this and this and this. And then you hold it up like this, and it's like, whoa, I went way overboard, you know. And if you do, you can kind of buff it out. I don't know about the, uh, you can buff it off of, like, the dye-based ink, but I'm not sure with the, uh, with the uh, pigment ink, you know, you might rub off some of that pigment ink impression. The dye-based inks are fine to kind of just rub off a, uh, a gel pen uh, um, on glossy cardstock, at least. Okay, here's white. All right, now the white one is going to have the strongest contrast, of course, so, like I said, you know, kind of be mindful about how that mark is uh, affecting the overall. Let's 
See that moonlight on that branch now? It really stands out, doesn't it? Let's come over here and let's bring this tree out from the background a little bit. See, like, just a couple little touches like that. See that right there? It really captures that moonlight, doesn't it? And it doesn't take too many. Now, again, if I only had a white gel pen, you know, you can do this with just the white and you'll be just fine. And that's most of the times that's what I do. Like I'm at, you know, if I'm at a convention or something like that or whatever. And for years I didn't use, I didn't have that range of tones, you know, so I just use white. Before white gel pens, we use these things called white paint pens. There was a uh, one from Sakura, I think, and one, yeah, what was the other one? God, I can't remember, but they're similar to those gold and silver pens. With that rattle ball, ball shaky thing on the inside, I, I can't remember the name, but those worked really great too back in the day. But gel pens are so much better, as long as you get ones that work. And don't clog on you, you know, after, you know, little to no usage. I'm not sure if there's really bad gel pens anymore. There's so many uh, brands out there, and they just do it a little bit thinner. And uh, Uniball's still out there. So see that? Put a few highlights on the side to the uh, tree. This kind of reiterates lighting, too, doesn't it? You put light on the sides of the objects that are facing the moon and it really strengthens this idea of light direction okay This is really fun on these uh, leafless pine stamps. Look how dimensional that looks now. I mean, it's a flat design, but this to me looks really three-dimensional just for the fact that it's reflecting some light in parts of it and not on other parts or parts of the branch or whatever. But not the whole branch, so... You don't want to outline everything or something like that unless you're going for some kind of uh, more, uh, I don't know what it would be, some kind of, you know, real different kind of graphic look or something, you know. <clears throat> okay, now, let's add a few little highlights here and there in the uh, sky. Here's the moon right here and see these clouds up here. Let's bottom light those a little bit. Okay, I'm going to turn this... Let me clear out some space here. Okay. Okay, so let's bottom light these clouds a little bit. Yeah. Every cloud has its silver lining, huh? So see, in these darker areas, maybe I'll use a little bit less, you know, highlights. In the lighter areas, I can use more. Okay, you see this cloud over here facing the light, right? You can see where it's lighter in the design itself, too. And all I'm doing is just I'm just going and reiterating that. So I've tried to really control lighting within the designs so that they inherently have a light source reflected in the uh, impressions. So that all you need to do is just kind of follow that if you choose to add shading or lighting. Highlighting, I should say. Okay, so see what that looks like. Looks kind of weird, huh? But when you look at it really at arm's distance, it just really becomes a subtle little reflection of that light. Okay. 
Add some out here in some of these clouds, maybe. I'll handle most of those areas, though, with uh, pigment ink, which I think we're ready for now. This is 10-point uh, glossy cardstock, and it keeps kind of bowing on me that way. I have to kind of keep counter-bending it a little bit, like that. I always recommend to people to get just go with the... Uh, pay like two or three dollars more and get uh, per ream per 200 sheets if they're doing that to get the 12 point 12 points so much nicer than this 10 point thickness um, okay um, let's see I'm trying to think of this this applicator is kind of whipped out look how fuzzy that is I kind of want things a little bit um, frayed and loose, so, but not that much. Okay, here's my Q-tip. This is how I kind of, I kind of loosen it up a little bit in the uh, tip, just because I want a real kind of light, kind of feathery application of that. Don't fray it too much, but just kind of loosen it up. Use real cotton if you can too. I don't know. I haven't really used an acrylic one that really works for this purpose. It kind of goes on too blobby and hard. So if you want a soft application of something, it's just better to go with a soft applicator, okay? So see, this is, so this is tight and this is kind of soft now. Don't unwind it completely though. I don't know. You'll get a feel for it. Okay, color box frost white. As I say in all my videos, if anyone ever has a problem with this, you know, in terms of uh, difficulty applying it, it's because they add too much ink, okay? Now I'll purposely add a little bit too much here, okay? And see, if I lightly dab this, there's still kind of a thicker amount of paint. You want it to look like that more than that, okay? But doing this will give you the feel. You know, kind of blot it off so you have a good idea of how much is applying. Okay, so here's, watch this, one, two, three, four, five. And you can barely see it there, right? That's what you want. So see, as I start building it up like this, it becomes more opaque and thus lighter like that. Okay? So here it goes again. One tap. There's nothing there, okay? And that's what you want. You don't want this to be completely dry where it takes you 100 taps to see anything. But, And you're going to apply this lightly. Now what happens is a lot of times people get that but when they're getting used to this process, then they do it on their scene, they can't see anything, so they tab it harder, and then they'll get, you know, a much harsher application of paint. You don't want blobs of paint everywhere. You want this light, kind of airy application of it. Okay, now let's see. Where do you apply this? We're going to apply it where kind of light meets dark. So light meets dark here, light meets dark, light meets dark here. There's lighter areas down here, in here, light meets dark, okay? And you just start applying it in those lighter areas. Now let me do it where there's a little bit more contrast so you can see what's kind of happening here. Okay, see that? There's almost nothing there, but just keep doing it. And see, light meets dark. Now you have that kind of, that moon is glowing a little bit now, more now, right? See that kind of haze right there? And that's what I kind of like in moonlight. See these clouds where light meets dark? Or light meets dark. Let's put some moonlight into those clouds. And the clouds are supposed to be vapor anyways, right? It's, it's moisture in the air kind of being... Uh, and where we can see it, it's, it's because it's being illuminated by light. So we get that nice illumination there. And it's also that soft light, isn't it, you know? Generally, moonlight is really soft. Okay. Now, this, I took off a lot of paints or ink, so I'm going to re ink. Hey, look at my tip here. It's really getting a little bit frayed. Okay. So I'll need to, let me pack that back down here. I don't want that all completely loose like that. Okay. All right, so let's see down here. There's this area. That's part of the area that I kind of blotted off inherently 
before I made the impression, if we remember that. Oh, here's this bird down here in the moonlight. Maybe I'll put some over that uh, bird. See that? Where it's now. That bird is kind of now being illuminated a little bit. Just a nice light touch, okay? Work little small areas. Don't try to do everything at one time. Kind of just work an area so that you get a full range of kind of the application from a little bit whiter to a little bit um, darker as it moves into that darkness. You want it to kind of taper off, you know, less, more ink in the light, less ink in the dark. Now, <clears throat> if you start applying it in the light area, you can really just, you know, you can tap ink up and just go right into those areas, but just, you know, just be mindful when you move out into the darker areas. Okay, see that? Kind of starts glowing a little bit more the lighter you take it. You don't want to do too much everywhere, though. It's kind of nicer, just like the gel pen, too kind of oscillate it a little bit. See, like this bird right here, I can put some on its back, but maybe not on the front area, just, you know, because the back area is where the moonlight is kind of hitting it more. And I, I think that gives uh, your objects a little bit more variation, which is nice, you know. It's not just all um, one value. Okay. I frayed this one enough. Let me loosen up this one. I, I, I'll loosen up that other one too, that other side a little bit too much. So, okay. Now, most of our pigment ink pads, unless you're using it all the time, they're really wet, <laughs> and it is. I call it paint a lot of times because I think it it almost is like paint. Okay, and it's really thick, so. <clears throat> be mindful about how kind of juicy your pigment ink pads are because they're usually very because we just don't use them as much as like our you know black dye base pad or something of that sort I mean I found these pads recently um, in storage and they haven't been out in I don't know, I'm guessing nine years. And I mean, they're just as juicy as ever. Now, I don't live in a, <clears throat> a real arid area, you know. And they weren't sealed up or anything. They were just, they just had their lids on. They were just in an open box, you know, outside in the garage. So, um, they, they really uh, stay juicy for a long time. One of my favorite pads is uh, one that uh, it's so dry that I, I almost don't need to tap it off. I just ink up straight into it, and then I just go, you know, directly into my uh, scene with it. So anyway. Uh, that being said, don't throw away. If you like this technique and you're going to be doing it, don't toss out your, uh, your white uh, pigment ink pads, because you can use it for this purpose. It's ideal for it, where it might be too dry for doing like embossing applications or something like that. Okay, let's add, that's around that moon. Look at that moon now, how it's really glowing and it's kind of glowing around these, these objects that are, you know, flying in front of it are kind of glowing a little bit. Let's see that. Right there, it gives it that kind of softer glow. And now let's do the same thing on some of these clouds, some of the clouds that are kind of facing that moon. As long as they're in kind of a little bit of a lighter area, this white looks okay on them. You can't really do this in the darker areas. It just, it looks too out of place having kind of this white vapor and, you know, kind of an area in the shadows. Here's this area of light against dark, right, that tree? So, let's see what that looks like on that side of the tree facing the light, the moonlight. Kind of puts a little bit of uh, moonlight on those trees, doesn't it? And I'll do it 
on the uh, right side of it and not on the left. Again, just to kind of reiterate that light direction um, of the composition. This type of application of ink, you know, it really makes for an easy process. The concept might be strange at first, okay? But nothing within this kind of process is really hard. I mean, if I go like this, I mean, there is nothing that has been done. It really takes, you know, a few taps. I mean, it doesn't take forever. That took me like two or three seconds, okay? And I've put that little bit of a tone on that tree, but look how effective it is. All right, but look how forgiving this is too as a process. Okay, this there's a little bit of area of light in there. I mean, that was like a real haphazard application of it, right? But if you just make it easy for yourself and make it where kind of, you know, you can tone in very gradually, but you know, it's, it's kind of an expeditious process. You can get that kind of glow going in here. Let me use a little bit more ink. Okay, see that right in there? And if I hit a bit too much, you can just dab a little bit off. Here's some up here. It makes for a nice, easy process. Just don't rush it. People use too much ink um, in the beginning, and I do too. I had to get kind of used to it. You know, like if I get a brand new pad, I got the... Uh, Hero Arts uh, Unicorn one, which is a really fantastic one to stamp things in. But this pad is really super juicy, so I typically use my used color box ones, but the Hero Arts one is the same type. Just, you know, you just have to dab in very lightly, two very barely touching taps into the pad, and, you know, then you really have to dab it off a little bit, but it's ready to go, you know. So, with colors, to get the saturation, you know, spend time with your first color especially. With the highlights, just take your time with doing that, and you won't apply too much. And this one, just allow yourself a little bit of time to apply it, and it should work out just fine, and it's a super easy and forgiving process. You notice there's you don't have to stay within lines here. I'm going over some of these trees and some of these branches. You're not having to work around things like you are with um, like outlines or something like that. Just like the stamps, you know, are kind of designed to just overlap and to um, apply in much more of a freeform type of uh, process. Okay, we have these clouds up here. Well, let me use a little bit more down here, too. I'm stamping upside down so I can kind of get to these areas easier. Okay. This one's kind of bottom lit. Over some of my branches as well, maybe. Kind of varies the, uh, the look of that branch a little bit. Now this could also be just, you can put fog. I'm kind of doing what might be, you know, deemed, you know, kind of more of a, uh, a highlight or something like that, you know, and that it represents kind of softer edge of the existing objects, but you can also just add in some kind of haze somewhere. Let's do it up here in the uh, clouds a little bit more so I can kind of just add this in and touch, you know, here and there, like this. And then you can put some down in your trees, okay. So let's go with this here and there. I 
think down here we can have a little bit more of a passage of light. Is that fun? Is it? Isn't it really? It kind of comes alive, doesn't it? You know. And what you're doing is, as I've mentioned in some other videos, it's when you're doing this here. You're really adding an element of softness. Most stamped pieces, everything is very sharp and focused, which is what you want in most impressions. You want your impressions and different forms of stamping would be nice and crisp. You don't want them blurry, okay? But having kind of a textural change within a given space can really add to kind of the visual, visual I don't know, kind of language that you're using within a given uh, scene or card by just having that soft element in there. And having these kind of soft elements are kind of nice, but you don't want everything soft. You want there to be kind of a nice interplay of soft and uh, uh, sharp, so they can they can play against each other. You know, in other words, I wouldn't want to put this pigment ink over just everything. You know, unless you're doing maybe like a foggy, super foggy morning or something like that, represented in some scene. Uh, for the, for the most part, you want a little bit of this oscillation of soft and sharp, just like you want some, you know, light and dark, you know, um, whatever, dull and bright, and, uh, I don't know, there isn't too much of a warm and cool interplay in here. There's a little bit of the Caribbean blue. I mean, some of those blues look a little, little bit kind of warmer than others. This looks like a cool area, and I would say that looks like a little bit of a warmer area. So there's a touch of a you know, warm, cool interplay in this, I would think. Or I would say, uh, from looking at it. All right. Okay, now I'm going to think about adding in a little bit of a uh, texture into this. I think with that splatter paint technique. But before I do that, let me think about adding a quote in here. <laughs> this is a really large scene and I wanted to give myself some uh, choices here, compositional choices as far as perhaps adding in uh, some kind of word stamp in here. But I think would go very, really, really well. If I do that, I want to stamp that out before I do the splatter painting because the splatter painting gives me kind of this textured surface, you know, of, of raised paint where it won't give me kind of the opportunity to do a real crisp impression. So we want to do all impressions first if we do that. So let me take a look and see what I have, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Okay, I think I found a sheet with several that will work very well. The picture is a poem without words. I. I'm kind of leaning towards the uh, to the mind that is still the whole universe surrenders. I think that would look really nice in here. Um, this one really caught my attention to a good traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent on arriving. Lao Tzu, but uh, I don't know. Maybe that one apply to this because these ones are very. Uh, they do have very fixed plans. You know, nature. You know, this is it's not intent on arriving. They're not going to any kind of just you know anywhere. But this one's really good too. Uh, I don't know. There, there's all kinds of good ones in here. But I think to the mind that is still the whole universe surrenders. That one's kind of... It, I like the font of this one and the size of it, so I'll do that one. Let's see. 
Uh, and I think that fits really nicely in this area. Yeah. Okay, now this one's going to have to be reversed out, so I'm thinking about a brilliance pad. Um, just to give myself a little bit of a stronger impression of it. This is a little bit more opaque and it dries fast on glossy cardstock, but it's still going to be a little bit more translucent. Okay, so that means that some of that color will show through, which I kind of like. I don't think I want this quote to be so strong and white up here. You know, I think it would be a little bit distracting. And I want it to harmonize with the, uh, the, uh, the tonal um, range of the, uh, of the uh, scene. So, or I guess that more specifically that area of the scene. So if I stamp this out and a little bit of the blue showing through, then so be it. It'll, it'll be somewhat akin to kind of maybe that color rather than like say white. Okay. We don't want it to show up though. So let's see if I can get this in there. Well, I don't always. Sometimes it's crooked, but... Um, that's something that I don't really worry about too much. I have to kind of be mindful that this is on cling foam here. This is one of my cling foam versions of this uh, stamp set. I'm just practicing right now. i got to move this down a little bit. Sorry, but right here, let me see if I can zoom out a little bit. I need to get this a little bit closer to me so I can see right over the top of it. Okay, let's see. I'll do a test print on this black piece of paper first. Let me even test out this brilliance. I haven't... Uh, there seems to be plenty of ink on there. I wasn't quite sure if it was dry or wet. Okay. Now that's on black, so you can see that it really doesn't stand out too much, you know. This is white here, you know, with the gel pen, so you can see the contrast. It's much more of a gray, gray scale, so... Um, I don't remember what font this is. It's like Century School Book or something like that. Okay. Yeah, would this be good with a stamp as in Schnur? Sure. But anyway. Yeah, I could have stamped it a little bit higher. To the mind that is still the whole universe surrenders. Eh, surrenders is a little bit obscured, so what? <laughs> See, that's what I say if it comes out like that. I mean, I could go over that with a little bit more ink, then you just re-stamp it in a, you know, the stamp positioner. Because it's still a little bit wet, but not going to do that. All right. So let's move on. I think that text adds kind of a nice, um, kind of graphic look. To, it would be bad to have something down here, too. Like a little word. It'd be kind of interesting. Maybe. I don't know. But let's get to this. One of my favorite techniques is the uh, bleed-proof white. I just love it as a textural kind of addition to, uh, I don't know, just to a surface. It's just a lot of fun to apply to. And it takes me back to childhood of doing some sort of splatter brush application of uh, paint. Okay, okay, just turned up my... Uh, exposure here a little bit. The exposure got reset when I when I turned off the uh, the uh, recording looking for a quote. Okay, here we go. Now I just used this the other night so this should be... yeah, it needs to be mixed up a little bit. Okay, so I have a little bit of water in here. You just add a little bit of water to your bleed proof white when you use it, and it reconstitutes incredibly well and just goes right back into solution. This is one of my favorite mediums, is it just. It just. It does what it's supposed to do without fuss. 
it's super dependable. I mean, I, I can have a bottle of this that just goes completely dry and it's completely solid. And you just add that water back, back into it and it's ready to go. Um, you can have it sitting around for, I don't know, 15, 20 years like I did. I, I used this in school for college for some purpose. I don't remember what we got it for. And, uh, I don't know, I didn't pop open that bottle again for, I don't know, probably 15, 20 years after. Maybe it wasn't 20, maybe it was 15, I don't, I don't remember when I started doing this, but... Okay, so you want enough in your brush, you know, to splatter, but you don't want so much that you're going to get a big blob on your page. Okay, so... A little test splatter. This is going to represent maybe falling snow or something like that. So you just kind of bend it back and try to go a little bit vertical. I don't know, I guess you can go at an angle too if you want to go for this kind of the more of like an angled splatter. Let's see that like that. See that's that's a really nice texture there, I think, you know. Get a little bit more practice in. <laughs> I guess that's enough practice. It looks like it's coming out exactly the way I want. Okay, so let's take a look on this page here and just apply some down like this. Maybe it's uh, a little bit of falling snow. First snow of the year, maybe, type of thing, because you don't see any on the branches. It's going over some of the birds and some not. I think I just got some shipping supplies at the door delivered. Okay. Nothing like a good splatter, huh? Look at that texture. I'm just barely, I'm kind of just barely running my finger along that. I don't always have a good control over this too. <laughs> Sometimes I add too much or too little. Or I just, having so much fun, I just, I keep adding too much. But it is really fun to watch that kind of develop. And again, this, this paint is, you know, as far as a process that's forgiving. If, if I don't like some of it, this dries real kind of crusty. And it just buffs right off. And it doesn't really affect what you've stamped underneath it because it just dries so fast, you know. This is kind of like, I don't know, it's like chalk in here or something like that. So like, say for example, I don't want some of that on that bird, you know. I'll just wait for it to dry, you know. And we're talking like a minute. And uh, I'll just kind of wipe it right off. And it'll come right off very easily. And let me see down here. See this right here? I think I can use a little bit more right down there. Okay. Something like that. Okay, I need to go wash off my thumb here. Okay, let's see what we have here. Little refinements. I don't want some of the... Uh, yeah, let me see. I have a scraper tool. I was just going to buff it off with a piece of paper towel, but I have this scraper tool from my uh, for use on the uh, stamp board. And I'll just take off a, a couple of these little dots here and there. OK. 
Okay. There was a couple larger ones and that were kind of obscuring my uh, bird a little bit that I wanted off of there. But otherwise, let's take a look. Let's take a look at a close-up shot of this, okay? See that texture in there? It's like first snow or something like that. Sit down here. Doesn't it make that area up here a little bit more interesting? Down here. Look how nice that texture is just kind of applied over the top of that. We go up here. Look at that. I mean, that's something that you can do manually with a, you know, a gel pen, which is what I do most of the time, but sometimes it's nice to have that kind of more, you know, slightly more random element, you know, that splattering would provide, provided it's kind of a, a little bit of a controlled splatter. Because I have gone like that, and I just had too much ink in there, and there's a big blob. But then you just allow it to dry, and then just buff it right off, and it comes right off. Okay. Let's add a little bit of a fun element to here. Not that everything else isn't fun, too, but um, on that splatter, what I did in this scene is I had those little kind of glowing little spheres, you know, which are really fun. They can represent stars where, you know, there aren't any clouds like this. I guess it could represent that or something, but these little glowing little kind of pixies or something like that or elements are really nice to do or add into the scene. It's just, I don't know, it's just an, another excuse for texture. See that like that in there? And again, remember, just kind of blot off some of it so you don't have a, you know, a big blob of this ink going down. This paint will dry. Uh, pigment ink will dry um, darker, so sometimes if it looks like you've put too much, you really didn't because when it dries, it'll look darker. And then if you spray it, that pigment ink won't show up as much because it, it's like if you've ever sprayed pastels or chalks, they darken, right? Same things happens to, to this, so just keep that in mind. See these little glowing little spheres like that? Look at that, what that does. And here's some out here. It's like, it's like adding light, I guess, you know, lights into your scene. It gives the appearance of like this little pinhole in back of your pieces being illuminated, you know, and shining through. You can do it kind of a cool Christmas tree too if I stamp like that spruce tree and I put these little dots on it and I put this little glow, it looks like little glowing little spears. Or maybe these are kind of uh, snowflakes or something like that. That's really too much ink. So I'll just blot it off here. With the, you know, with the clean side of my swab. Or you just kind of dab on there like that. It takes off some of that ink. But maybe these are little um, bits of snow. I'm kind of adding this over some of those larger splatters that landed on the uh, scene. and making those ones glow a touch. Or I can add a, you know, a gel pen one, a larger one, wherever you want. So I'll kind of keep that consistent. I'll just do kind of some of the larger ones and give them that kind of softer glowing dot like that. But let's take a look and see. I'll show you what that looks like overall here. Okay. We need a couple over here too, don't we? Let's add a couple more. I 
as this dries, as this pigment ink sets up, I can tell it's already getting a little bit darker, so I'm just reapplying and adding a little bit of a thicker application of this um, pigment ink. kind of reapplying here and there, or just building up the tone a little bit more so it becomes a little bit more, eh, kind of moving towards um, opacity. It's still very translucent though. You know, you get that blue ink sh kind of showing through. Okay, down here I can use quite a bit more. I'm going with a pretty full saturation because I can see it really kind of dried darker. But you just kind of build it up. It's really not bad that you uh, that it kind of dries darker because it it allows you um, kind of a little bit more freedom to apply it without you know worrying about kind of some kind of precarious type of thing. Because in other words, if I did one thing like that and it really showed up, you know, it'd be a little bit more of a precarious. Um, process, but this way, you know, where every given mark isn't quite so uh, influential, you know, you can kind of just do what I'm doing like this. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm doing it in kind of some, it's roughly specific areas, but not too much, though. I'm just not adding it in, you know, too much in the darker areas, but around in lighter areas, you, can, you know, it's, there's much more freedom to uh, apply it. And like I said, you can kind of just dab it off. If you put too much, just dab it off a little bit and it comes, comes right off. Even if it dries completely, um, you can just dab it off and it'll come right off of there. Or you can buff it off with a, you know, napkin or paper towel or something. Alright, so... I think that is about... It. Kind of a nice migration somewhere, daily migration or whatnot. First snow of the year, to the mind that is still the whole universe surrenders. I don't know, kind of makes for a nice composition. As far as imagery goes, what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight images over this paper. If I didn't have the two different trees, you can just use one tree, but use it at stagger the heights a little bit. And then if you have like a black dye based pad, and a lot of you have, you know, type of other types of black pads like a VersaFine or something like that, maybe vary it a little bit, you know, have two different uh, tones, um, black tones for your imagery, and that can vary it. Look at, you know, we can see it right here. Look how dark the uh, the Versafine was, and you can see some of these were uh, the Marvy pad, the dye base pad, so pigment versus dye gives you kind of, I would call the Marvy real black, but next to the uh, the Versafine, it looks more of like a variation of gray, so this is may maybe more like a 95% and that's 100%. I've always said the Marvy is really close to 100%, but that's relatively speaking. When you put that Versafine down there, it's really black, but see, it varies it. And these uh, characters back here were done in, was it blue and black? I already forgot, but, uh, you know, they're farther back in the distance, so I stamped them in... A lighter tone than these ones, but they could be stamped in black, you know, it just, there's all kinds of variations you can do, and one's not better than the other, it just gives you a little bit of a different take on it, or a different look. Anyways, hope you enjoyed the scene, as much as I enjoyed stamping it. These stamps will be out soon.
my rubber guy is waiting for his matrix boards, which are kind of uh, a little bit delayed from his supplier. I guess they have to make them. I guess I guess they were on holiday or something like that as well, or off for the holidays. But uh, I'm enjoying my test print of this uh, image and of all the uh, images. I, I should do like a like a series of these uh, bird ones at uh, kind of dramatic points in the uh, you know 24-hour period, uh, twilight and dusk and dawn or whatnot, because they make really strong silhouettes against whatever kind of a color scheme and light source you're doing in a scene. So, thanks again, and hope the uh, scene was a fun one for you to watch.